All right, uh, so hey guys, welcome back to our lecture series. Uh, this week we are going to be talking about geometry and specifically the kind of geometry that comes up a lot at ICPC. So the first thing we're going to talk about is sort of how to represent a lot of uh, geometric stuff in C++. And specifically we're using C++ because it has a lot of nice uh, built-in stuff for this that, like, for example, Java does not have. Um, so all of this would be doable in some other language, um, but it would, you would just have to write more of your own code, basically. So uh, sort of the main thing we're going to be using is we're going to be using uh, the built-in complex number class um, to deal with points, um, which is a very nice way of representing it because you just take basically x plus yi, you let that correspond to x, y. So we're basically just using like the normal complex plane, um, but we're sort of thinking about it not as complex numbers, but as just arbitrary points. Um, so yeah, this is sort of all the setup you would need for that. Um, and then once you have these type defs and these macros, um, you can do something like this um, and yeah, so you can basically work with points like that. And the other thing we're going to be doing is we're, we're going to be using um, points and vectors kind of interchangeably, right? Because this point is basically just this vector from the origin. Um, so sometimes when we have a point, it's going to represent like an actual point, And sometimes it's going to represent some vector. OK. And uh, with this complex class, there's all kinds of uh, built-in functions for points. So uh, with addition and subtraction, um, you have like the usual vector addition and subtraction. Um, you also have scalar multiplication division. Um, and you can also do uh, like get the length or the length squared of some vector. Um, and yeah, we have all this other stuff. You get you can get the angle, it forms with the x-axis. Uh, you can construct it basically in polar form. Um, you, you have a lot of nice things here. Um, okay. And then uh, the other main things we want to be able to do, or we want to be able to do two-dimensional cross product and dot product, right? So like you have a point A and point B, where it's like x1, y1, x2, y2, we want to be able to get their dot and cross products. Um, so what we can do is we use the conj function, uh, which takes the conjugate of a, so just negates the imaginary part. Um, and if we look at conj a times b, that's going to be this product here. Um, and it does the usual like complex number multiplication. Um, so i squared is negative one. Um, so if you do this multiplication out, you're going to get this quantity here. Um, and you'll notice that the real part of this is the dot product in two dimensions. And the imaginary part is the scalar cross product. So we're not actually like getting the vector form of the cross product, but, but we're, we're just doing like the, the 2D cross product basically. And so, yeah, this is just dot product plus i times the cross product. So if you want to get dot and cross product, you can use these macros. All right, questions on any of this point stuff so far? All right. Yeah, so that's just the basic point stuff we're going to do. Uh, OK. And then uh, sort of a more complicated thing we can do is when we want to represent lines. Um, and th there's a lot of ways to do this. Like I think uh, in a lot of the ICPC problems, they'll do it in standard form. So they'll do like AX plus BY equals C or something. Um, but th that sort of leads to a lot of edge cases and stuff. And it's very annoying to work with. Um, so the way we usually do it is you represent a line as uh, basically the struct of two points plus a Boolean, um, where one point is a point on the line, 
then another point gives you basically the direction vector of that line. Um, and the third parameter is a Boolean, which indicates whether it's a line segment or a full line. Um, so sort of what this looks like uh, for a regular line, for like a full line, um, if you have A and B as any points on the line, um, P would be A, um, D would be B minus A, right? Because that's sort of the vector from A to B. Um, and S would be zero because that is not a line segment. So you have the full line here. Um, and so basically what this gives you is the line is gonna be of the form P plus D times T, where T is basically any real number. All right, so this is just kind of the normal vector way to deal with lines. All right. So then for a line segment, um, if you let A and B be the endpoints, the way we usually do it is um, P is one of your endpoints, D is the vector from A to B. So notice they're not like arbitrary points on the line anymore. We do it with the endpoints. Um, so that basically this direction vector is going all the way along the segment. Uh, S is one because it is a line segment. And now the line is still gonna be of the form P plus D times T, but now T has to be in the range zero to one, right? Because as T goes from zero to one, you go from P plus zero T, so from P to P plus D, which is A plus B minus A, which is B. All right. Okay. And then the third case, which doesn't come up as often as the other two, is if you want to deal with the ray. And so it's sort of the hacky way I've been dealing with this um, is you just think about it as a really long line segment. Um, so you let A be the endpoint of the ray. Um, and then B be some point like infinitely far along. So like say 10 to the 15th along this line. Um, and then you basically just structure it the exact same way you would structure a line segment. So A is going to be here, or P is going to be here. D is going to be this huge vector going all the way out to infinity, essentially. And S is 1, because we are thinking that this is a line segment. And once again, we go from T equals 0 to 1. But again, T equals 1 is bringing you all the way out to infinity. So this is essentially a ray, like for all intents and purposes. And you do have to kind of worry about um, precision issues and stuff like that, because you don't want to make this too big, um, because then you're going to lose a lot of precision, because you're only going to store the first, I don't know, however many digits accurately. But 10 to the 15th is going to be fine. OK. All right, any questions on lines? Now we're dealing with them. So going back to the original line, there's no rule of like making sure that the uh, vector is like a unit vector. It's just A is arbitrary and B is arbitrary. Yeah, yeah, I mean, any arbitrary points. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you can have it be a unit vector. This is just the way we've been doing it. But yeah, we're not making it be a unit vector. Right. All right. OK, so then um, the main thing that we're going to use lines for that comes up like over and over again uh, is line intersection, um, which is where this form we're using, like the, the vector form, is going to be so much nicer than trying to do standard form. Um, so basically, if you have some lines like P1, D1, 0, P2, D2, 0, we're assuming they're like full lines for now. Um, Basically, you're just trying to solve this equation, right? You're trying to solve for T1 and T2. Um, and you can separate this out into components. So you have the X equation and the Y equation. Um, and so now you have two equations, two unknowns. So you can solve for this. Um, and it turns out if you do all the algebra, um, you basically get to this. So T1 will be what's inside the parentheses here. So then your intersection point is P1 plus D1 times T1. So this is your intersection point. We're not gonna go over all of the 
solving system because it's just a lot of variables, but get it down to this eventually. Okay. And then uh, to modify this for line segments, uh, what we do is you basically just uh, find the point the way you would before, like we did on the last slide. Um, and then all we have to do is check that it's sort of in range here. So one thing you could do is sort of find the T value um, where like you subtract off P1 and then do some stuff to find the T value. But there's actually a cleaner way of checking if a point lies on the segment. Um, and that is you find the vectors to the endpoints in the segment. And if you check their dot product, um, it should be negative if they're on the segment, negative or zero, right? Um, because let's say you're on the endpoint, then one of your vectors is gonna be zero. So the dot product will be zero. Uh, and if you're on the inside, they're gonna be pointing in opposite directions like this. So your dot product is gonna be negative. But if you look at when it's on the outside, they're gonna be pointing in the same direction. So your dot product is positive. Okay, yeah. So if one or both of these lines here are segments, um, you can basically just find this point and then do this dot product check to see if it's in range. Okay. Oh, and then obviously if you're implementing this, um, you want to make sure that the lines do intersect so they're not parallel. Um, so that's just something you have to check before doing this because otherwise D2 cross D1 is going to give you zero and you're gonna have division by zero. But yeah, all right. So now we're gonna talk about some stuff with polygons. Um, and the first thing is uh, area of a polygon, uh, which uses the shoelace theorem. Um, basically what this lets you do is get the area of any polygon in ON time. Um, it doesn't have to be convex or anything. I think it does have to be not self-intersecting, um, but that self-intersecting polygons are almost never gonna come up, so that's fine. And basically the way we do this is for every point, uh, you imagine you have some horizontal line below it, the, below the whole polygon, and you can drop perpendiculars down from every point. Um, and you, you have your points in some order, so like clockwise or counterclockwise order. And then for each pair of adjacent points, you're going to look at um, the oriented area of the trapezoid. So basically, if your arrow is pointing towards the right, you take like the positive area. Um, and if your arrow is pointing toward the left, you're going to take the negative area. Um, so you can kind of think about it as like the area from the line of the first point to the line of the second point, where like if you go backwards, it counts as negative area. So like here we're going forwards, so you have positive area, positive area, positive area. Then we're going backwards, so you have negative area for this trapezoid and backwards, so negative area for this one. And if you look at the area that's left over after we do all these additions and subtractions of the trapezoids, um, so these three trapezoids are gonna give us this whole shape, the, the three forwards trapezoids. And the two backwards ones are going to subtract out everything below the shape. So what's left is just the area inside here. Um, and how do you figure out the uh, order to take them in again? Uh, either clockwise or counterclockwise. I mean, like, how, how do you get, like, the points sorted in, in order? Um, well, I mean, if you have the polygon, you have to sort of already know what the ordering is, because there could be multiple if you're not, like, explicitly given the ordering, right? Like, we could go through here and then back and then through here or something. All right. So we're, we're assuming we have some ordering, either clockwise or counterclockwise. Um, yeah. And so uh, the one thing to be careful of is, uh, I forget which direction is which, but uh, if you're going either clockwise or counterclockwise, then um, this formula here will give you the negative area because it'll basically do like negative area for all the ones like here and positive area for these. 
Uh, so you have to make sure you take the absolute value of uh, this whole process. Um, but otherwise, yeah, you, you can be either clockwise or counterclockwise. And yeah, so again, we're not going to go into like uh, the full derivation of this, but um, if you sort of look at the formula for the sum of all these trapezoids, uh, the oriented areas, it's going to come out to basically sum of the cross products um, of the adjacent points times a half. And again, you want to make sure you have the absolute value in case you're in the wrong direction. And so then the code for this is pretty straightforward. Um, you just store an ANS, um, store the previous point, and you basically just add the cross of the last of the previous point and current point, and you set the previous point to current point. So yeah. Any other questions on this? All right. So now we're going to talk about a convex hull. So um, a shape is convex if uh, if you pick any two points in it, the line connecting them is fully inside it. So like this shape here. You pick any two points inside of it, uh, the line between them is going to be inside it. But, um, like let's say we had like a hole dug out here, then that wouldn't be the case anymore. Um, and so, a convex hull of a set of points is the smallest convex polygon that's uh, that contains all of them. So it's going to be some subset of the original set of points. Um, and given a set of points. Um, we want to be able to find their convex hull in n log n time. OK. So the way we're going to do this is, so first we're going to find the upper convex hull, which basically think about it as like the top half here. Um, and the process for the lower half is going to be essentially the same. Um, so what you do is you sort the points lexicographically. So basically first by x coordinate, then if there's ties, you break those by y coordinate. Um, and then we're going to have some like list of points uh, to store the upper hull, which is initially empty. And then we're going to iterate through the points in order and basically remove the bad points at each step. And we'll, I'll talk about more what that means when we do the example. Um, so, OK, so we start off here. Um, because again, we're iterating through points in order of x coordinate and then breaking ties with y coordinate. So, this is our first point, and we put it into the hull. Um, and this is this point by itself is like fine as a convex hull, right? There's, I guess, we haven't really explained what the bad part is, but we, this point is fine, so we leave it. Um, then we add in the next point. Uh, this is also a valid convex hull because uh, it's sort of convex from above if you look at it. Then we're going to keep adding in points. These are all fine. These are all fine. Then we're adding in this point. Now, if you look at this shape now, this is no longer like convex, right? Because we have, uh, we want basically all of these angles um, to be facing downward, but we have this angle facing upward. Right, so this is no longer like a convex hull of these points. So what we're going to do is, and we, we determine this by looking at the cross product of like this vector with this vector. And you can tell that like it's pointing the wrong way. So now this point um, is bad, so we want to get rid of it. So basically you throw this point out of the hole and we reattach here. Um, but Looking here again, we have another angle pointing up, essentially. Um, so we want to get rid of that one, too. And now we're back to a point where all of our angles are facing downward. Wait, what if our shape was just the points we have so far? Then wouldn't you want to include that point we removed first? Right, uh, except right now we're only trying to get the upper part of the hull. Oh, OK. okay. Yeah, so we're, we're just getting the top half right now. Um, 
Okay, so then we add in this next point. Notice we have another angle pointing up, uh, so we want to get rid of that. Um, and we keep going. So this point is fine. This is a valid upper hall. Um, then we add this point, so we have to get rid of this last one. Um, and we're going to add another point here. And we get rid of this point. And finally, we add this point, and we are done. OK, so we've basically constructed this upper half here. All right, uh, questions on this process? OK, yeah, so we have the top half now. Um, and so then what we're going to do is reverse the order of the points um, and then go through them backwards, essentially. Um, and then that's going to give us the bottom half here. Um, so now we have these two vectors of points. Um, and we want to join them into one vector that's going all the way around. And basically, to do this, uh, you can notice that they're always going to share the first point and the last point, and not any of the other points. And so if the point with like the minimal and the maximal x is unique, then that's pretty clear why that has to happen. Right? So like on the left here, um, this point has the minimal x. No, all the other points have bigger x values. So it makes sense that this point would have to be in both the upper and the lower, and that it would have to be the end point of both of them. Um, but it turns out this is also true if um, the minimal or maximal x is not unique. Like here, we have two points with the same x value. Um, but notice that uh, it still holds. We still only have one overlapping point. Um, and that's because uh, of the way we're sorting, right? Because we're sorting first by x, then by y. So this point is going to be considered before this point for the upper hall. So we're going to get um, like this angle on the hall, and then we're going to throw this point out and then just get this. Whereas in this one, we're reversing the sorting order, essentially. So this point is going to go before this one. So we're going to add this one, and then this one, and then everything else. So we're going to keep both of these points. Um, so yeah, based on the way we're sorting, we're always going to get uh, exactly one endpoint in common at each end. So then to join it, all we have to do is uh, like remove the last point from each of them. So like remove this one here, remove this one here, and then you can just iterate through this one in order and iterate through this one in order. And then that'll give you your full hull. All right. Um, so code for this. Um, just some basic setup stuff. Um, this is a nice macro that sort of sh shortens any code for vectors. Um, it's just you have to type out less. Um, and this macro, uh, the Z macro, is very helpful for geometry problems because, in general, you don't want to compare things to zero um, because of precision errors and stuff like that. Um, so to check if something is zero, you want to basically do something like this, uh, where absolute value is less than eps, and you want to do eps generally about 10 to the negative 12 is a good value if you're using lower doubles. Um, and we also want to define this uh, lexicographical comparison um, here, which is how we're going to sort the points for the convex hole. Um, so basically, if a dot x minus b dot x is 0. So if they're equal, we compare by y. Otherwise, we're going to compare by x. And by putting this in uh, namespace std, um, now if we sort it, we don't have to sort of add in our own function. It'll automatically use this function. OK. So then um, the code is going to basically look like this. So we make our empty uh, upper hull and lower hull vectors, uh, sort the points. Um, then we're going to basically fill the upper hull with the upper hull of the points. Then reverse it, fill the lower hull with the lower hull of the points. And then you have your two pieces. And then once you have your two pieces, you can connect them like we were talking about before or do anything you have to do there. Um, yeah.
And then the do haul function is basically just going to do this. So iterate through the points in order. Um, basically, while you have this uh, non-positive cross product between your last three points, um, remove the last one. And then after you've removed all the bad ones, then you can add yourself to the end of the haul. OK. Questions on comeback soul? They're never going to, I mean, comeback soul is a problem solving tool, right? Like, like, are they ever going to actually just, this is not a problem in itself, right? Right, or, exactly. Okay. Um, and we're going to talk about using it like in problems um, in some of the next couple of problems. We're basically just using it as a tool. Um, and it's it's not even super important to like know the code or anything because you can sort of black box it. Um, but it's it's a nice thing to know. All right. So uh, now we can get into some actual problems. Um, so these are problems that have shown up at ICPC in some past years. Okay. So first problem is a brokered point, um, which basically um, is a point in a triangle where if you look at these three angles, uh, PAB, PBC, and PCA, they're all equal. So we want to uh, basically find the coordinates of a point given, um, find the coordinates of the brokered point given the triangle. So do you guys have any ideas for this? Sounds like some kind of nasty trig. Like you would take an arbitrary angle alpha for the first angle, then the second angle like is determined, and then like do some formulas to figure out what the like what alpha you would need so that the third angle actually matches. Um, so you can do it without trig. So it's not going to be like a closed form, um, but it is going to be. Uh, like much nicer to implement than doing a lot of trig stuff. I mean, maybe you can do binary search on the on the angle or something. Yeah. So the solution is going to be a binary search on the angle, but then the question becomes, how can we do that? Right. So. Uh, you you basically fix some angle for your first angle here, right? Um, and then you can sort of look at what would happen if you did that angle. Um, but the question is, how do you know uh, like which half of your search space to recurse on, right? So how do you know if your angle is too small versus too big? So how do you like distinguish these two cases? Okay, I mean. Just based on the picture, I would assume it's like you calculate the area of the kind of like intersection triangle. And if it's, I'm not sure actually which uh, sign you would need for bigger and which sign you would need for smaller. Yeah, uh, so that would work. Um, so yeah, you could take the like the oriented area here um, and you want to get that to zero. Um, there's kind of a, a cleaner way to do it. I, I guess I can just show you guys because that's, that's essentially what you're going to do. Um, but there's sort of a nicer way to look at it. Um, and that is basically you want to look at one of these lines um, and then look at the intersection point of the other two. Um, and then you can get uh, this blue vector from uh, the start point of your red line that you're looking at to that intersection point. Um, and now all you have to do is take the cross product of the red vector and the blue vector. Um, and if that's positive, like in this case, you're gonna have a positive cross product from red direction to blue direction, then you're too small. Otherwise you're gonna be too big. And essentially all this is checking for is, is this intersection point above or below the red line? Um, because the point we're looking for is where this intersection point is exactly on the red line, which means they all intersect at the same point. So yeah, you, you can basically binary search 
um, using just the one cross product. And uh, obviously need the intersect method too to be able to compute this intersection point. Um, but yeah. Okay. So the next problem is uh, the golden ceiling. So you have this box in 3D space um, and there's a plane that cuts through the box and um, basically removes everything above it. So like in this case, this plane is gonna get rid of this whole upper half here. Um, and there's a similar thing happening in these cases. And what you wanna find is the resulting area of the ceiling of the room. So notice that the ceiling can include parts of um, both this slanted plane and the original top of the box. Um, so you want basically the sum of the areas of those two pieces, right? So both the, the slanted piece that intersects with the box and the remaining top. Okay. So one thing to think about for this problem is uh, everything we've talked about so far has been two-dimensional. So how can we uh, get this into a nice two-dimensional form? This problem seems a little nasty, but I would, uh, I mean, I don't know. I guess, I mean, you solve for the line where it's um, on the top, like you, uh, what do you call it? Or rather. Where like the plane intersects the top? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I forget how you would do that, I guess. Um, oh, right, right. I mean, you need to do a plane intersection. Um, Yeah, so, uh, oh, this, this should be CZ, but you can do that by, so your, your Z is gonna be H um, at this point. So basically your line is gonna be AX plus BY equals D minus C times H, intersecting with the top, right? Um, and yeah, so you, you can get that line uh, in standard form and then convert that to the line format we had. It would be a couple of cases, but it's not too bad. Um, and yeah, I think you're close on how to look at it as a 2D problem. I think I'll just show you guys the next slide. So sort of the idea of what we want to do is look down from the top and think of it as a two-dimensional problem. Um, so you have this line intersecting the plane at the top of the box that we were talking about before. Um, and you can also find the line intersecting the plane with the bottom of the box, which is this line here. And so now if, if we're thinking about it purely as a two-dimensional problem, looking down from above, we're splitting this up into three areas. Um, so uh, assuming we have these three areas, how do we then solve the problem? Uh, assume we've computed A1, A2, A3. Wait, sorry, what is, the why do you need bottom A3? Oh yeah, so A3 is not gonna matter for the answer at all. Then it'll just be A1 plus A2. Not exactly, right? Because um, sort of the, the area of the plane over this region is gonna be different from uh, if, if it was like flat over that region. Right, it, it's it's slanted, so its surface area is going to be different. Um, close. Um, what do you call it? A one plus a two over cos theta, where theta is the angle between the z plane and the regular plane. Oh, z z equals yeah. zero. Yeah, pretty a much. Plane. Yeah. Um, so basically, it's going to be the it's going to be a1 plus like some constant times a2. 
because the area of the plane is going to be a constant times uh, the, the area of like this cross section of it. Um, and if you look, so one thing you could do is get the angle um, and take cosine of that, and that would work. Um, you can also think about it as like a calc three type problem um, and look at um, like taking some small piece of the plane and what would that area become? Um, and it turns out the area, if we have our plane in standard form where it's like AX plus BY plus C Z equals D, this constant is gonna be uh, this. So square root one plus A over C squared plus B over C squared. So there's a couple ways to get that. Um, so now all we need to do is find A1 and A2. Um, and then our answer is just going to be this. So this is where we get into sort of the more geometry part of the problem, where how do we find A1 and A2? And notice that we don't really have any constraints on what direction this line is going in. Like this, this line here, it could be in this direction, but it could also be like here or here or anything. Or this whole section above here could be the top. And this could be the slanted part here. There's really no restrictions on where this line is inside the box. And the line, top line also might not even intersect the box at all. So how can we sort of nicely capture all those cases without um, having to actually do all those cases? I mean, I was thinking we calculate bottom A3 the same way we calculated top A1, and then we just subtract to get A2. Exactly. Um, so we just have to figure out how to get A1, and then we can do A3 the same way, and then that gives A2. Um, but yeah, so how are we going to get A1? Well, I, th I thought we would just figure out the line that like intersects plane and z equals h, and then I guess solve for when x equals 0 and y equals 0. Um, yeah, so we can get these intersection points. But what I was saying before is um, that's not enough information because uh, let's say we let's say we had these same intersection points. This whole section up here could be the top, and then slant plus bottom could be down here. Um, and oh, also that that's what you mean. That's what you mean. Yeah, and and top could be like some weird shape, like uh, I don't know, like something like this. Like you could have a trapezoid or whatever. So how do we determine sort of which side of the line to look at? And then once we have that, how do we get the area? to get the area. Eric, something's up with your audio. At least for me. Yeah, me too. Um, yeah, so we... Um, so we could use shoelace. Um, there's a couple things with that, though. So one is, how do we get the other points besides the intersection points of this line? Um, like, how do we know to take this point versus these three points? And the other thing is, how do we know which way to order all those points um, like to get shoelace to work? Because we have to have them in either clockwise or counterclockwise order. Um, I, I guess the, the first question is just going to be more important. So how do we know which of these endpoints to take as vertices for the polygon? Thank you. 
Wait, you can take area of... Wait, no, never mind. So what, what would be like the condition for a vertex of the box to be a vertex of the top piece? Think about it independently of this line. How, how do we know if a corner of this box is good, like survives as a piece of the top? Um, if the vector from one of the corners to one of the points is like, wait, no. Yeah, if, if the vector from one of the corners to, to, to one of the points is like non-zero, or, is, or rather has like one coordinate that's non-zero or something. Um, or rather both coordinates, like like you don't have one coordinate be zero and then the other be non-zero or something like that, I'm not sure. But I mean, again, there's the, the idea where like we could make this whole section the top and this part the slanted. Um, and then that wouldn't change the like the vector from here to any of the points, unless I'm misunderstanding. This part is kind of tricky to see the first time, so I think I'll just show you guys. Um, so basically what we want to do is first, you get the intersection points between the plane and the top, uh, so these two points. Um, yeah, and we're going to put these points in a vector. Then uh, for each of the corners of the box, we're going to look at the height of the plane at that point. And if that's at least h, then we're going to add that corner to the vector as well, right? So if you think about the height of the plane at this point, it's going to be more than h, right? Because this top piece is still here. It was not cut off by the plane, which means the plane has to be at least h at this point. Whereas for all oh. these points, the height is going to be less than h. So we're not going to put them in. Okay, that that's gives us... That's pretty nice. Yeah. Uh, so that gives us the set of points uh, like this is the set of endpoints of the polygon for A1. Um, and we could do some case work to figure out what order they're in. It probably wouldn't be too bad, uh, but sort of the easiest way to deal with that is not even try to do shoelace, just put them all in a vector and take the area of the convex hull um, because this shape is always going to be convex. Um, so yeah, so that's how we can get A1. Wait, how do, actually, again, how, how do you figure out um, where the points are that are not the corners? Um, so the only other points besides the corners are the intersections between this line and the outer box. Yeah, but there's like several cases for where that line could intersect, right? Yeah, I mean, it. Yeah, oh yeah, so you're gonna have to do like four checks. You're, you're gonna have to check, oh, okay, okay. does this line intersect this segment? Does this line intersect this segment? And you just do all that. But yeah, you, you wanna treat these as segments um, and this as a line to do all those checks. But yeah, you're gonna have to do four checks for that. Okay. Other uh -huh. questions? Just use binary search to figure out where on the segment you have a point. <laughs> binary search does come up a lot in these problems. Um, like I think like two out of three of the geometry ones last year you could use binary search for. I don't know. But yeah, the binary search is like very common in these. 
Um, yeah. Yeah, so this is how you can get A1. Just throw it all in convex hull, find the area. And then we're going to do a uh, similar problem, a uh, similar thing to find A3, except now you're looking at the bottom. So you want to find all the corners that have a height less than zero at this point. Um, and then, yeah, so you can do A2 equals LW minus A1, A3 to get A2. And yeah, so now once we have A1, A2, we just use that constant from before and we have the answer. All right. Any questions on this problem? Okay. All right, cutting the cake. So uh, you're given a triangle and you wanna find a line that splits both the perimeter and the area in half. Um, and it's guaranteed that there's at least one line like this for every triangle. Ideas? I'm gonna give you guys some hints because this one, uh, when we first looked at this one, we got stuck on this one for a few hours. Give you guys some hints. So if we assume the line contains some point P on the edge of the triangle, um, we can find the line through P that splits the perimeter in half, right? With some small amount of casework. Um, and we can get the other intersection point Q uh, of that line in the triangle. So we, we have some line PQ, where P and Q are points in the triangle, that splits the perimeter in half. Um, so how can we sort of use this idea to try to find the actual line? Any vague ideas or anything? Wait, I, I'm sorry. What? Can you repeat what your sub point is? Like, get the other intersection point Q of right, this yeah. line so, plus the triangle. Uh, the, the intersection point of the line and the triangle, essentially. Oh, so, oh, 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 yeah. So if if we can sort of do this for an arbitrary point P, like find the other point that's halfway across perimeter wise. Um. And we want to find the, the line that splits the perimeter and the area. How can we sort of use this idea? So any vague ideas, you don't have to have a full proof or anything. This is totally out there, but I mean, can we choose one of the, uh, I don't know what you want to choose, one of the endpoints in the triangle. Um, as one of our points and have it go through the other uh, line, go through the longest side of the triangle. Okay. Actually, um, in terms of like finding a viable point for the, actually no, it might not help with that much. It's easier to think about, but actually it might not help with that much to go to like, uh, an endpoint of the triangle. It actually seems kind of useless. Yeah. So if you go through an endpoint of the triangle, that line is only going to work if um, if it's isosceles and that vertex that you're going through is um, like the unique vertex. Right, yeah. Okay. Uh, I think I'll give you guys this next hint too. Okay, something vague, but you have like relative slopes where you say like, is it better to add to one side or subtract from the other side, like if a line intersects two sides. 
Like which okay. which 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 direction increases area? That seems kind of on the right track. So the next hint is binary search. So yeah, like that that was the point. Like what you yeah. say which direction increases areas, and then you use binary search to try to find it. Like you start with a point P on one of the segments, and then I, I guess you kind of binary search on each each segment, like to see if it works. Yeah. Um, so how do you sort of do the binary search? You were saying like you're looking at which direction is increasing the area. How do you like check that? We're a little bit long time, so I think I might just show you. Guys. I mean, maybe you can just like um, see, like you you place a point on one like point of the triangle and see where it ends up, and then place a point on another point of the triangle and see where it ends up, and just see kind of like which areas they're gonna just be like, okay, let's just extrapolate from there. Yeah, exactly. So uh, let's say you pick some initial arbitrary starting point A. Uh, and we let B be halfway around from it. So notice that if we sort of move A all the way around the triangle to where B is now, the areas have uh, swapped. So that means the sign of X1 minus X2 has changed. Um, and because this is gonna be continuous, it has to be zero at some point in the middle. And at the point where it's zero, then you're gonna have equal areas. Um, so we can sort of binary search around from A to B because we know that some point along this part has to be a valid solution. And oh, wait, that, that's more intelligent than what I was thinking. <laughs> and basically the way we do this is you make sure that um, at each step, the, uh, the endpoints of your range always have different signs for x1 minus x2. So you do like an invariant binary search basically. Um, and to find x1 and x2, um, I think the first time I did this, I used convex hull to find the two areas. Um, but a much easier way to do it is one of them has to be a triangle. So you can use Heron's formula to get that area. And then the other one is just the area of the big triangle minus that small triangle. Um, so you can get the areas that way. Um, yeah. So yeah, you basically just carry out this binary search. Um, and eventually you'll find a point where the two areas are equal. Okay. So we have one more problem and this one um, is probably the least nice of the problems we've talked about so far. Um, and yeah, so this one, um, it has kind of a lot going on. Um, so I think I'm just gonna talk you guys through it because I don't think I could have solved this one on my own. I, Adam solved this one um, like a couple of days ago and you, the solution is, it's very nice, but it's also very non-intuitive. So I think I'll just walk you guys through it. Um, but basically the way this works is you have some big cylinder C and you have a pipe going into it. Um, that might be horizontally offset or tilted vertically or both. So like the vertical tilt is like the line is slanted up uh, and the horizontal shift is like, you'll notice that this line, there's a gap between these two lines. Um, so a better picture would be like this. So like the top view, you can have like a gap in between uh, the axis of this cylinder and the axis of this cylinder. And you can also have some slope phi here. Okay, and, and of course you're also given like this distance and the two radii of the cylinders. And basically uh, your goal is you wanna find the length of this intersection curve. 
trying to find this arc link. Okay, so there's a, a lot happening here. Um, but basically, what you want to do is you, you want to approximate this arc length which, with a bunch of points scattered along the curve. Um, and so the idea is how do we parameterize points on the curve? And we're going to do this. Uh, basically, we want to parameterize the points by um, what angle they make uh, on this circle here, right? So like here would be theta equals zero, and we're gonna loop around until we get to theta equals two pi and put like 10,000 points along this circle here. Okay. Um, and we can give an explicit formula um, for, yeah, so what we wanna get is basically the points on this part of the pipe, and we're going to project them down. Um, but first, we're just trying to get these points on, on this part of the pipe. OK. Yeah, so basically, the point at angle uh, phi is going to be um, s, which is, um, I should have marked it on this previous diagram, but s is going to be this point here, um, where we just take like the point zero d zero and just project it out like infinitely far or whatever. Uh, so we take s uh, plus v one cos theta plus v two sine theta, where v one v two are like basically your basis vectors for the plane of that circle on the pipe. Um, yeah, and then basically expanding out for V1 and V2, we can get this formula here. Okay, so we have all these points uh, on the circle. Um, so now the idea is how do we project um, our 10,000 points from the circle down to the cylinder? Um, and the answer here, um, as with most of these other problems, is we want to do a binary search. Oh, we just have the code, okay. So basically the idea here is, given a point here, we want to know how far we have to send it back to get it exactly on this cylinder here. So we want to project it back some amount between um, zero and length of s, because remember, this length here is length of s. Um, and we want to project it back some amount such that the distance from this point to the origin is going to be exactly rt. Does that make sense? So with the binary search check, we're checking is the point inside the cylinder? Because if we're binary searching on this range, it's going to be inside the cylinder for this half and outside the cylinder for this half. So we're just trying to find this splitting point here. And we're gonna do that for all 10,000 of our points on the edge here. And then once we have that, we're basically just, uh, just treat it like a polygon 3D space, just connect them all, find the perimeter. So any questions on this? Because this is complicated. Yeah, the basic idea is you get a bunch of points here, project them down here using binary search, and just take perimeter. Well, so is the objective of putting all those points to get within a certain, um, like a certain degree of the complete answer? Oh, yes. Oh, will the problem specify that? Like, your answer should be within this amount? Yeah. Um, will, there, will there be a hint that indicates that, you know, you can sort of estimate in some to some degree? Right, yeah, so that was a big hint for this one, um, because the precision for this one is like 10 to the minus 3. Um, so you can have uh, a decent amount of error and be fine. Um, yeah, most of these problems, I think, will be like accurate to like 10 to the minus 3 to 10 to the minus 6 or so. Um, but yeah, this one was 10 to the minus 3, so you have sort of the freedom to be a little bit imprecise with how you're calculating arc length. Yeah. 
And so the code for this is going to be uh, mostly what we just said. Um, the one nice thing Adam did here is, um, so this is um, like an actual 3D problem, unlike uh, Golden Ceiling, where we converted it to a 2D problem. So we can't use complex numbers for this. Um, so what Adam did is used Valarays, which um, basically let you uh, like declare an array of some type, like of some length, and then you can use normal like addition and subtraction on them. So like um, he, he made an array 0, d0, and you had this point s, which itself is an array of length 3. And you can do subtraction on them, um, which is nice. So it, it's basically arrays, except you can do operations on the whole array if you have two arrays of the same length. Um, so you lose some of the nice things about complex numbers, like um, you no longer have like the abs function or something like that to get distance. Um, but it gives you some of the nice structure we had before, like the addition subtraction. Um, I think it also has scalar multiplication. Um, yes, you do, because you have scalar multiplication here. So that's sort of a nice way to do like 3D points, I guess 40 points if you have to do anything crazy like that. So what is this Valerie? Is it like a structure in C or something? Yeah, it's a C++ thing. If you look up uh, like C++ Valerie, it has a list of all the things you can do. It's basically, I think, all of like the arithmetic operations. Um, I think you can do stuff like sine and cosine, where it'll basically apply sine and cosine to all the elements of your array. Um, it basically just lets you treat an array as like a single number and operate on it. Yeah. But in general, if you can keep it to 2D and use complex numbers, that's generally much nicer. Well, but why is there no vector? Vector, like actual vector rather than vector? Oh, what was that? Sorry. Why is there no like actual vector in, in the standard library? Oh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's just like the uh, rayless vector. I don't know. That is annoying. But yeah, and then, yeah, then here's the rest of the solution. So we take the 10,000 points, we find the point, and add up the distance. Okay. Uh, any last questions? If you get a WA on a geo problem, how do you figure out if it's like probably accuracy error or probably like something else is wrong? Um, yeah, so working with like epsilons and stuff is always very messy. And it's hard to know if you have enough precision. Um, so one thing you can do, uh, it'll cost you a couple submissions, but um, if you think it's a precision error, you can make your epsilon like very small. Um, like, I don't know, 10 to the minus 20 or something. Um, and see if like that works or if you get TLE. Um, I, I guess that only really helps if you can see what test case you fail on. Um, but yeah, you can sort of play around and see, with the epsilon value and see if that changes what verdict you're getting. Uh, in general, I think if you have like 10 to the minus 12, you should be okay usually, but it really depends on what you're doing. So I don't know. It's very hard to tell with a lot of these epsilon issues. All right. Yeah, so thank you guys for coming. Um, as always, slides are up on the Discord. Um, so yeah, hope to see you guys next week.